Through high school and college, I was a fairly serious rock drummer of all things. And what makes that fact a little more fun is the fact that one of my casual friends from high school ended up becoming the drummer for Pearl Jam, a rather small group here in the Northwest you may have heard of. <laughs> Occasionally, if the stresses and strains of dealing with massive volatility in the currency market hits me, I can always pull out my drum set and bang away for an hour or two, and that, that actually relieves stress to some degree. It's not always we get a chance to experience the entrepreneurial journey firsthand. Most people don't. What drives it? What motivates someone to quit their job and the security of a monthly paycheck and venture out in pursuit of mastering a craft? Well, that's what we're talking about in today's episode of Top Traders Unplugged. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, where my goal is to give you the clarity, confidence and courage you need to invest like or invest with one of the top traders in the world. It is the stories that you never get to hear set out as the most honest and transparent account I can make of what goes on inside the minds of some of the best investors in the world delivered to you via one-on-one -on -one conversations. Today you're listening to episode 43. If this is the first episode you've heard, you might want to go back and listen to all the earlier conversations. On today's show, I'm talking to Mark Whitmore. But instead of me doing the introduction, why don't we let him do it? I guess I tell people that I'm a portfolio problem solver and uh, after people get a glassy look in their eye, I basically say that uh, I invest in money, which is in and of itself somewhat fascinating to a number of people because I literally take positions in foreign currencies and hold them for periods of time, uh, hoping to make money on those positions. Thanks for doing that, Mark. And by the way, if you want to read the full transcript of today's episode, Just visit the toptradersonplug.com website where you will find great details from today's conversation. Now let's get started with part one of my conversation. I hope you will enjoy it. Mark, thanks so much for being with us today. I really appreciate your time. Well, thank you very much for having me. Pleasure. Mark, I'm excited about our conversation today because I expect it to be quite different to some of my recent episodes. Uh, firstly, your background is quite fascinating. Your trading approach is very different to many of my guests so far. And you're at a stage in your fund management career, which is full of opportunities yet faced with many challenges at the same time, which I think a large majority of fund managers can relate to. So this will not be a case of telling a story of a 40-year career, but rather a real-time account of what it's like to be building an alternative investment company from scratch. But before we get to your story, I wanted to ask you a different question, a question that I sometimes struggle with myself. And as I keep asking the question to my guests, I realize I'm not the only one. So it goes something like this. Imagine that you're invited to a reception with people you don't know. And after a few minutes, someone will come up to you and ask, So Mark, tell me what you do. How do you respond? How do you answer that question? 
Yeah, that, that is challenging when I'm in such a relatively niche area of finance to begin with. And what, what I've come to determine is uh, I introduce myself generally as a portfolio problem solver. Okay. Fantastic. Um, let's stay with you for a little while longer. Tell me your story. Um, how did you get into this business? Um, you know, and go back as, as far as you want, because uh, I know that it's, uh, it has been uh, a tale of, of, of uh, many bends and turns along the way. Yes, that is true. Uh, well, I ended up having a pretty keen interest in the concept of, of sort of savings in general. I remember from a fairly young age, my uh, parents adopted me when I when they were fairly late in life, and both of them had grown up during the Depression. So I actually had instilled in me from a, a pretty early age the importance of kind of having a nest egg and the kind of joy experience you one experiences when you see sort of that grow over time. And I recall I I think even as a third grader, our, our elementary school library had a single book on stock investing. And I remember checking it out and bringing it home and being fascinated and talking to my uncle who had a brokerage account and, you know, thinking about holding a stock and seeing it grow and the idea of collecting a dividend. I quickly sort of understood that. And so really from a very early age, I was I was intrigued by sort of the idea of uh, finance in general and, and certainly resonated kind of with the Albert Einstein's comment about the you know most powerful force in the universe is compound interest over time. Okay. So uh, that was kind of my early, early int intrigue with finance and investing. And then in college, I, I was a real macroeconomic guy, especially on a global level. So I, I tried to study as much international economics as I could. Uh, a lot of it was, was quite uh, theoretical, quite frankly. There wasn't a lot of practical finance kinds of, uh, of issues that I dealt with for the most part. But sure. I did come across a very you know, seminal work for me, which was a random walk down Wall Street, you know, the classic Burton Malkiel book. And I, I very much, uh, at the time, that completely resonated with me, this idea that, you know, there's this kind of uh, efficient market and that information gets priced in very quickly. So I, I had this sort of working understanding of the financial markets uh, in college, which, again, was totally theoretical, had no practical basis sure. for applying it or anything. Uh, and from there, my career took a rather, you know, kind of windy series of turns. I started out, I was actually a prep school teacher and coached junior high school football and a number of other things right. uh, for about three years. But then I went back and I did a law degree, which I combined with a joint uh, master's degree of international studies. And at that time, I revisited some of the sort of theoretical things I had been doing in international economics and finance and specifically began to look at how some emerging markets developed quite amazingly in a post-World War II period where others, notably Latin America, seemed to really languish and, and sort of try to get under the hood and figure out what, what were the factors that led to that. And in, in doing so, began looking at currencies and what really affect currencies over time in terms of macroeconomics. But again, totally theoretical. And, and after I did that joint degree, was working as an attorney and uh, you know. And so what I've, what year are we? Sorry to interrupt here. What what year are we now? Uh, roughly. Mark? Sure. So so basically, I had uh, been doing my uh, work at the prep school between kind of the, in the early '90s. Spent mm -hmm. about four years doing the two degrees. So it was '96 that okay. I came out and began practicing law. So sure. we're talking a little over 15 years ago, and uh, I quickly determined <laughs> that. That practicing law was not for for me. I I had uh, great respect for a number of my colleagues. There was a super esprit de corps, but but ultimately from sort of a, a passion standpoint, and that's always been really important. And sort of an energy standpoint, I I, I felt uh, a little dissatisfied, and so I quickly concluded that my strategy was going to be to essentially sort of live as, as frugally as possible, try to set aside enough of a nest egg because I felt like I wanted to do something else, and sure. and. It, Right about the first two or three years of practicing law, I began to have a surprising development occur, which is for the first time in my life, despite the fact that I was in my mid-30s, I actually had money to invest. And so now all this theoretical information that I had sort of acquired over years had a practical implication. Yeah. And it was interesting. It was a fascinating time, as as you know, being in the late 90s and begin to, beginning to get into investing because, you know, I come from this sort of intellectual tradition of the efficient markets uh, sure. approach. And so I was just looking to buy index funds. And, and as the late 90s continued to evolve, 
I, I became increasingly suspect of this of this entire premise uh, because I talked to a, a number of my really, really smart legal colleagues, uh, generally smart, who had with their finances decided to invest in a, in a number of relatively unknown tech startups and some flyer stocks and the like. And, sure. and I kind of began asking these questions like, well, what 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 is your expectation for their earnings prospects and all mm-hmm. that? And and nobody, of course, had any earnings. You know, sure. I mean, we're looking at eyeballs and, you know, all metrics are different. And, you know, I remember from a very early time period hearing that the four most expensive uh, words in the English language are this time it's different. Right. And, and indeed, uh, I heard that enough that I began to modify into, even though I didn't know what it was at the time, more of a, a behavioral economics approach, which is that, well, wait a second, maybe prices, especially in the tech market, aren't really rationally derived. Maybe there is this sense of the herd running in the same direction with enough force that they drive prices to irrational extremes, which this is the key implication, creates a profit opportunity. Sure. And at that same time period, roughly, was when the East Asian financial crisis had basically fully come to fruition, yeah. which at that time created incredible opportunities in Asia. So I kind of decided to do an about face. Uh, my paradigm was kind of blown up, if you will. And, and that's when I first began seriously looking at kind of a, a contrarian approach, at least at the extremes, mm-hmm. in terms of investing, and, and more or less kind of I would consider to be a deep value approach as well. Mm-hmm. Okay. And um, you were still practicing law. When did you decide that, okay, I've got enough now saved up and uh, maybe it's time to uh, to try some of these uh, theses that you had uh, acquired? So... I was about midway through my, I, so I practiced for a total of six years until 2002 and it, and I was not surprisingly paying off some graduate law school debt sure. for the first several years. So by, by 2002, I had set aside about a year's salary essentially, which I figured, uh, you know, was not obviously something that I expected to be able to parlay into a lifelong, uh, investing career, but I thought it would give me a bit of a runway at least so that I'd be able to begin to hopefully deploy some strategies. And I guess my default plan was to try to find something in the financial services sector in general, like financial advising or consulting that I would be be able to do. But as I left, uh, and like a lot of things in life, timing is a lot of sure. a lot yeah. of success. Sure. And so for me, you know, looking to get back into or looking to now apply sort of my analysis and currencies to the real world, sort of the tipping point for me was that up until about 2000, roughly, unless somebody went to a bank and bought like 10,000 Australian dollars and stuck them under their mattress, there wasn't a lot that a retail person could do in the currency space. Uh, you could you could do futures and manage futures and, and everything. That was a, a space that I was kind of naive enough as, an, as a retail investor not to know very much about. Mm-hmm. But once the retail spot uh, Forex platforms came online for for everyday people. Then I began to revisit some of the strategies I had been looking at, which unleveraged were interesting, but not potentially really profitable, which now with leverage looked a lot more interesting. And at that time, 2001, 2002 was almost the very peak of the US dollar. And, and that was something that as someone even who was remotely familiar with the valuation of other currencies, you travel to countries and the dollar would buy a whole lot. And fundamentally, the dollar looked very, very, very problematic. Uh, sure. Greenspan had just cut interest rates to a half a percent at the time. There was pretty large current or structural current account imbalances and the like. So timing was important because essentially my meta thesis at the time was was basically to short the dollar and uh, that ended up being a very good thesis for a very long time sure now i'm curious a little bit the transition into currencies sort of both mentally and 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 now you've sort of started to talk about what happened that led you to or allowed you to do it practically but you were talking to your friends at the law firm they were making tons of money in equities and you know uh, tech stocks in particular um, yes. How did you how did you even start considering the currencies? Um, because not that many would look at that as sort of their first uh, uh, area of uh, in, in investment. <laughs> 
True. And and to be fair, I kind of initially kind of gently waded into that market. I had about uh, initially, I think it was 90 percent of my portfolio was more or less a long short combination, kind of long uh, emerging market equities, especially in Asia, okay. short tech stocks. And then uh, because of this a unique kind of academic background I had and, and the and the work that I had done in the back of my mind, I always thought if there was a way that I could actually, because I, I kind of was ballparking that my strategy, I thought would be able to garner somewhere in the, I don't know, five, 8% annualized return on an unleveraged basis. But sure. I was finding enough opportunities at equity markets, especially in the emerging markets, uh, that that wasn't that interesting. And then it was this realization, oh, wait a second, I can employ, and boy, talk about giving you plenty of rope to hang yourself with. I remember at the time you could set up these accounts and you could get a 200 to one leverage. I mean, yeah, half a percent wow. could double your money or you could you know, quickly lose everything. So from a, a, an important thing that happened very early is sort of developing a risk management approach. Um, I, I think the last time I read statistics that approximately 90% of retail currency investors have their account go to zero. Yeah. And and, and so for me, it was an issue of choosing prudent leverage where I could take advantage of the strategy that I had without suffering gambler's ruin. And, sure. and so that became and, and I have to admit, that's been the thing that has evolved the most over time, essentially. But so for me, how I got into currencies was really sort of a fluke based on my academic background. Sure. And that one other thing I picked up on in, 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 in your sort of early story here is um, it's the fact that you um, very early on seemed to describe yourself as a contrarian. Um, where did that come from? I think there were two precipitating causes of, of being, well, maybe three actually. <laughs> Apparently my, my, my mom said almost from coming out of the womb, I was arguing. So right. okay. <laughs> I always tended to be, and so I sort of felt like Oedipus trying to deny my fate when, when I initially got into law, because when I grew up, I never wanted to practice law. That was the one right. thing I didn't want to do. I had a very bad impression of attorneys. And here I, I find myself, uh, you know, in, involved in that very pursuit, which made my mom thrilled. But, but for me, I eventually, needed to get into something else. So that was kind of the first thing was just the natural, like, I've always been sort of a dialectical thinker and always want to take the other side of an argument. So I'm kind of naturally contrarian. But then the practical thing, why I thought it became relevant in finance was, and I should have kind of developed a little bit more in talking to my colleagues, it, it had a real impact on me, because what I realized was that this was, you know, I have great respect for my colleagues, but for lack of a better word, I'd consider it to be, quote, unquote, smart, dumb money. Uh, right. You know, these are really intelligent people, but yep. their understanding of like what makes markets and asset classes like move over time, especially in long periods of time, was not particularly sophisticated or well thought out. I mean, it, it really was something where it seemed to me that, you know, rationally, if everybody is running to the same side of a particular trade, that probably means somebody on the other side, if they have a longer term time horizon and can kind of weather some volatility in the meantime and some potential losses, might stand to make a lot of money. And so intuitively, that made sense to me. And then at the same time, I was reading uh, people like Mark Faber, who I thought was spot on correct in terms of identifying you know, things that with regards to the tech bubble. And Jim Grant was writing about this. And, and Bill Fleckenstein out in Seattle sure. here was doing the same thing. So there were some thinkers who I wanted to learn from. And so I was following them and their analysis and their analysis was compelling. When I read the other side, the bullish case, it seemed like, well, you've got the Fed, you know, Greenspan's doing everything he can to kind of keep this alive. We're going to, you know, we're going to be able to, you know, essentially have this thing last uh, for a long period of time. And, and it was what well, seemed to be very much focused on, well, there isn't anything like a catalyst that they saw in the immediate time horizon to reverse things. But to me, the structural issues were becoming so imbalanced, so out of whack that there it appeared to me a compelling case. There has to be an adjustment and the adjustment will likely come in a fairly violent way. Sounds a lot like today, doesn't it, when you t say it like that? It is interesting. I, I, I am not somebody who typically, you know, follows kind of these wave patterns, but I find it intriguing that, you know, March of 2000, you get the very peak of the tech bubble. And then uh, roughly, in fact, seven years ago, really today, I mean, sure. it was kind of late October, early November, very peak of the, 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 the general bubble in terms of equities, especially mortgage real estate market. Here we are seven years later. And <laughs> yeah, it, it has a very similar feel. What is it Mark Twain said? Well, history doesn't repeat itself. It definitely rhymes. And, and I think 
think that's that's very true. Sure, sure, absolutely. Tell me a little bit further. Then, sort of, um, you're now in 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 the early two thousands, and uh, uh, you're starting to uh, move into the currency trading. But but initially, uh, I'm assuming you're doing this for for your own account. That's exactly right. That's precisely uh, correct. I had allocated a fairly small amount of the portfolio to this strategy. But uh, again, good timing has a lot to do with this. I mean, uh, I guess preparation meets opportunity, right? Sure. I mean, I, I, I thought that the, the dollar was poised for a rather significant fall against a variety of currencies. Similarly, I looked and I was following precious metals to some degree. And, and to me, I kind of thought that, well, the precious metal, the kind of currency commodities, if you will, or yeah. currency, commodity currencies, yeah. the New Zealand dollar, Australian dollar, Canadian dollar, all looked remarkably cheap from a fundamental level. And they all had interest rates, especially New Zealand and Australia, that were significant. So I, it was one of those situations where I got paid basically to wait for the dollar to crash, right? I mean, I had a very good carry trade. The winds were at my back holding these positions. And so what I found was that the 10% of the portfolio quickly became the majority of my portfolio. And uh, and so I was continuing to simply build a strategy to manage my own money with the target ultimately. And I figured, I thought very early on, um, probably within the first year of doing this, that having a fund would be would be really satisfying and exciting on a variety of different levels. Uh, and I also wanted to make sure, though, uh, knowing that kind of being an economic historian at heart, that to take any one short period of time and extrapolate that into the future is a very bad idea, especially when there hasn't been numerous market cycles. So I sort of set in my mind a seven to 10 year window where I would employ this strategy build my portfolio, hopefully build a track record. And then assuming that that performed in a variety of different market cycles, then think about, you know, bringing it out to market, so to speak. Sure. Amazing. Um, now, I guess, I mean, if, if you want to elaborate a little bit about that period before you decide to set up your firm, I mean, did your trading was it pretty much defined from the beginning or did you evolve during that particular period of time in terms of how you were trading? And I also want to go into, before we dive into sort of the, the, uh, the more topical areas, I also want you to maybe explain why you think actually that there is a, a strong case for currencies as an asset class, in particular because currencies have been as an asset class, if I use that phrase, uh, a bit of a lackluster. It's certainly been difficult for many hedge funds uh, managing money specifically in currency. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that before we dive into sort of where you are today and, and, and we take it from there. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, for me, that is kind of the most interesting and exciting topic. So I'm happy that you, you sure. teed that up. Uh, I find a lot of what I do is essentially being a proselytizer in that uh, most people, like you said, view currencies and they see it through the lens of one of two things. One is it's strictly a hedging device, is that it's an insurance policy. You'll go ahead and take the cost, if you will, of hedging out exposure to different foreign, foreign uh, asset classes that you have that are domestically de denominated in those countries. Sure. Uh, and in essence, then you have a negative expected return. It's just the cost of the insurance. And then the second view on currencies is that it is this domain of essentially technical analysis, trend following, which, as you intimate, has performed extremely poorly. I think the last time I looked, the uh, Barclays Currency Traders <laughs> Index was up, I think, 1.6% for the last nine years. And yeah. so you're talking about really not even achieving you know, the rate of inflation, essentially. So your negative long-term returns, real returns, and currency markets in the aggregate. So uh, for me, getting to the issue of how my trading has evolved over time, I, I think one of the things that I, I felt very good about early on is I had spent years of, of my academic life essentially really trying to hone in on a model and an understanding of the fundamentals behind currencies. So right. while I, I didn't pretend to have any ability to quote 
time when these reversions to fair value were going to occur, I had a high degree of confidence, at least, that I kind of know what the end point's going to be. I don't know how long it's going to take to get there. I don't exactly know the path that I'm going to find myself kind of going to, to get to this end point. But the end point, at least, there was a degree of clarity. So pretty much when I first sat down in I think it was July of 2002, and essentially sort of devised a, a calculus for determining fair value of currencies. That calculus has remained intact for the intervening 14 years that I've been doing this strategy. Now, I will say that that that's not a static strategy. It's kind of a, a weighted approach. There's maybe 10 or 12 different variables I tend to look at, and depending on market environments and the macroeconomic backdrop and sentiment and risk and, and things, I will tweak the balancing. But the, the factors themselves have remained static for that time period. Uh, so that part hasn't modified, but the way in which it's deployed and the way in which I kind of tweak those variables has evolved over time. So what do you see in currencies as an asset class that maybe some of the firms that have given up in the last, uh, uh, or maybe I should rephrase that and say that the investors haven't seen in the last uh, decade or so, where, where do you see that, uh, you know, from a big picture point of view, nothing really to do with the way you trade, but just, just how do we paint that uh, in an attractive way to, to investors? Yeah, that's... That's that's a challenge, I'll say, because uh, most investors, and I would even say relatively sophisticated institutional investors, uh, have, again, this sort of static view of currencies being one of those two buckets I previously identified. So try to articulate a vision that if if you actually pay attention to fundamentals and if you see how macroeconomics uh, evolve over time and how certain currencies appreciate in in at least leverage terms quite quite impressively and dramatically and others fall that there really are consistent opportunities that the market presents them presents itself and and a lot of it has to do with uh, the fact that in the short term so many people will drive other assets to levels, quite frankly, that are unsustainable. I mean, one of the things I find so interesting about currencies, it's the, the biggest puzzle to try to solve in the world, I think, in that there's so many different elements that go into what's going to result in a kind of a currency valuation that one is able to take a variety of different variables and domestic, not just economic developments, but what's happening in terms of asset classes in markets. And, and that has a huge impact on pushing these currencies to different levels, uh, which are non-unsustainable. And that's that's really the opportunity, right? And so I tell people all the time is that volatility for me is the ultimate two-edged sword, because in the short term, it creates havoc in my life, right? I mean, directions that I don't sure. necessarily anticipate. But in the medium to long term, that's what creates the opportunity. And and so when I talk to people about currencies as an asset class, I say that there's two compelling reasons, one of which has been proven, one of which is not yet appreciated and understood. But I do think there's good evidence behind it. The one that's proven is that, of course, if you're trying to create an efficient portfolio frontier and devise a portfolio that's optimized, you want uncorrelated assets. And currencies indeed unquestionably provide that. Uh, if you look at what's what happened in the general financial crisis, you saw so many assets on the downside that had a correlation coefficient that quickly was approaching one. And so obtaining true diversification in traditional assets uh, was really a challenge. But there's no question that currencies can and do do that quite effectively. The second is being able to actually say there's alpha to be gained here. And on that front, there has been some really good academic work that's been done, one by a collection of four economists led by uh, Sarno that looked at currency valuations, macroeconomic variables, and risk premia. And they determined that even on an unleveraged basis that you can employ naive currency strategies. I mean, things like interest rate differentials and purchase power parity and obtain you know so solid results that have really impressive sharp ratios, actually, as well. And then the uh, Chartered Financial Analyst Publishing Institute also had something on a new look on currencies and went back 25 years and determined through back testing and whatnot that there were consistent opportunities to be gained using fundamental approaches, basically. So I, I think that there's some great work that's being done that basically says, yes, currencies as an asset class do make sense. You mentioned 
Well, a couple of observations I wanted to ask you about again before we go on to to the next topic. Um, I mean, one observation that I would say is that 25 years ago when I started in this business, we had a lot more currencies than we have today uh, in Europe uh, in particular. Um, mm. And also, it seems to me that at that time, um, individual countries' economic uh, environment, so to speak, were... Uh, not as controlled as we see today, meaning that, um, you know, the cycles, if we call it that, for each country and their currency uh, was kind of more determined by individual factors or unique factors to the country, uh, not as much as some kind of coordinated uh, approach uh, that we see today with all these uh, worldwide G7, 10, 20, whatever they call themselves. Right. And And so I wonder... Because in one hand, you would think that uh, the economies today are more in sync, and therefore um, maybe that maybe that means that there is a bit more correlation between um, currencies. But at the same time, as we know, if things are in sync, it could also actually mean that the movements you end up seeing become enlarged because. It all seems to happen at the same time. What kind of structural changes have you noticed in currencies um, going back and, and going back maybe beyond from when you started trading them? I'm sure you've started them, uh, you know, uh, going sure. back in time. Have, have you noticed anything uh, as, 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 as that has changed? Yeah, that, that's a, a super fascinating area to raise. And I think that you do have in some ways intention these two different developments, one of which you've articulated quite nicely, which on one hand you have uh, a coordination that you have not seen before, and especially in response to global financial crises. And mm. so you don't just have a situation that's very express like in the Eurozone where they've collectivized their entire currency regime, but you also have Switzerland, uh, Denmark, Sweden that are essentially having de facto pegs to the euro as well. So so you have a situation where, as you say, there's a whole series of currencies that are going to move in lockstep with one another, which would, on its face, presumably limit opportunities as, as things move in synchronicity with one another. But then the flip side of that is that you've had what I call an increasing era of monetary disorder. Uh, you have a situation where uh, you know, one of the questions I get is about currencies and the efficacy of, in, of investing in currencies is, you know, why would you want to invest in something which is a pure fiat-based regime, right? It's if, if you're tied to something relevant and, and You're in Switzerland, and Switzerland in 2000 was the last country to actually be even have its currency partially pegged by gold. And so, since 2000, we've literally seen a free for all in in the currency regime, essentially. And, and so, my response to that, though, is that creates the, I think, greater opportunity because. Currencies are the ultimate example of relative attractiveness. Uh, it's it's a situation where you don't necessarily. I, I, there's this kind of anecdote in in the United States about if we, a situation where two people are out in the forest and and hunting and uh, they see a bear and they they only have knives and and one of them starts to run and the other one's like, well, the bear's going to totally catch you and he's like, well, I don't have to beat the bear, I just have to beat you. <laughs> and in currencies, that's very a very similar thing in that is that there might be currencies that look from an absolute fundamental level to be not very impressive. But when you compare it to an entire regime of currencies, they, there's actually fairly good opportunity. So those are the kind of the two things that are sort of in tension, where on one hand, you have currencies in the short term that are increasingly synchronized and moving together. But like you say, once those once it becomes untenable to maintain a peg or a relationship and obviously the era of currency intervention is becoming more and more dramatic i remember when i initially got into investing in currencies the uh, bank of japan was sure. trying to defend a, a peg of roughly 115 yen to the dollar well you know that that quickly became com completely untenable at one point then the yen dramatically weakened and then it dramatically straight it dramatically weakened through 2007 sure. carry trade was in place and then that whole thing literally unwound more than any other major currency i've seen such that the yen went from 
kind of the 130s all the way into like the low to mid 70s. Yeah. And so real dramatic, uh, you know, mo motion that had occurred basically there. So I, I do believe that despite this increasing synchronicity of movements, you're seeing greater opportunities of these uh, sudden breaks, if you will. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, we'll come to it, I'm sure, a little bit later when we go into the strategy itself. Um, uh, but one thing I also picked up on, you used a word when you said there are still opportunities when you look at it from a fun, I'm paraphrasing here, when you look at it from a fundamental point of view. And, and I think maybe, I mean, the word fundamental is interesting to me because, because we've seen so many of these systematic firms in currencies actually close shop. I wonder whether you think that actually you do need some kind of fundamental approach to currencies in order to, you know, achieve the returns that that uh, are attractive enough for investors. Or is that just coincidental that you chose the sort of more fundamental uh, route? Um, I, I would absolutely agree with that. And I'll be the first to admit that I, I'm quite biased in my analysis. And, sure. and I call myself skeptically agnostic when it comes to achieving consistent alpha using trend following approaches or uh, kind of systematic approaches. Sure. Uh, essentially, I, I don't I don't think it's impossible to make consistent money. But I guess uh, I guess John Bogle said something about not only have I not met somebody who's consistently made money as a market timer, I don't know anyone who knows anybody who's done that. And, and at least my experience in the currency space is that there have indeed been some very successful strategies that have have worked for a period of time. Mm -hmm. But the ability to replicate that, I, I think, has been a real challenge. And mm -hmm. so to me, if I look at an industry that has underperformed so dramatically for, for basically a decade, I I question the validity, at least, of the major strategies being used. And that's not to say that there aren't people with within that area that can masterfully deploy them. Um, and so I, I, again, don't mean to cast aspersions sure. when there are people who are successful. But I think as a, as a general rule, it's tough. And I think one of the reasons is because as you – as we become so much more sophisticated and the technology related to algorithms and high frequency trading has 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 generated so much interest and there's been so many resources poured into that, it's hard to gain a competitive advantage. Mm. Almost any arbitrage opportunity on that front, to me at least, seems to be rather quickly gobbled up, if you will. Mm. Um, and, and so a fair question then to ask is, well, why would the fundamental strategy be any different, right? I mean, if, sure. if, if there's some insight that you claim to have, why isn't this being replicated elsewhere? And I actually kind of have a pretty basic answer to that, which is that the downside of the fundamental strategy that I deploy is the fact that, you know, for instance, I don't use stop losses. Uh, I mean, I carefully monitor the, from a risk management standpoint, you know, our portfolio, and I will take discretionary steps if need be. But the idea of a stop loss is sort of an anathema towards my very fundamental approach, which is theoretically, if I thought, you know the the Singapore dollar is particularly attractive at uh, one you know one twenty seven. Then it should be even more attractive if it were to weaken further than that. Sure. And and so I have found that uh, I've been very deliberate in employing a fundamentally derived strategy. Again, it's really related to the endpoint. As long as I can see the endpoint in sight, as long as I have and I have about 22 different currencies I invest in. So as long as I can create a very diversified portfolio where I'm not you know, heavily invested in one currency that just implodes, uh, because there are value traps that raise themselves periodically in, in currencies. I mean, the Russian ruble is an interesting currency at this point. I mean, is this, is this the ultimate currency value trap or sure. is this an amazing opportunity? And, and that's a really interesting and not particularly easy question to, to necessarily yeah. answer with any sense of definitiveness. I mean, when you use the word fundamental, I certainly also hear the word time frame. And I wonder whether the part of the edge uh, is not so much that it's fundamental per se, but it's the fact that you allow yourself a time frame that most systems can't. Yes. I want to do a little bit of a 
an experiment given where you are in your journey. So sort of fast forward from your beginnings of trading your own currency uh, book. Obviously, you know, you were very successful uh, at doing it. Otherwise, you wouldn't have launched your own business, uh, which I believe uh, was in 2012, if I'm not mistaken. Correct, right in yeah. the middle part of the year. So what I'd like to do is, here's my experiment. I want to try to, because you're running a boutique business, essentially, it doesn't make a lot of sense to talk about how have you structured your organization, uh, you know, uh, per se. But I think what makes a, a lot of sense is if you can take us back to the time when you decided to transition from managing your own money to managing outside capital and turning that into a business, how did you approach kind of the pre-launch phase in terms of getting organized and ready to take outside capital? What was the thought process you had to go through there? Yeah, that yeah, that's a I think that is a very interesting issue. For me, one of the reasons why I ended up going on the later side of even my seven to 10 year window of kind of launching a hedge fund, it was almost a full decade before I was able to get get the fund off the ground. And I waited that long, partly because I knew in advance that the biggest challenge of managing money is that while I might have an iron stomach and sure. discipline to be able to execute on a strategy, investors are not necessarily that patient nor as forgiving in the short term, if you will. So I, I needed to have a uh, sort of the financial wherewithal that should I enter into a time period where I started the fund and did not have spectacular performance out the gate, out of the gate, or were still even had substantially negative performance, that I would be able to actually weather that financially and not be in a position where I just have to sh kind of close up shop. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that I, I did organizationally and, and psychologically, I guess, was to do very careful sort of cost planning, cost accounting, um, and give myself a long enough runway that given this strategy strategy that is something which is a three to 10 year window sort of strategy that I would not be in a situation where I'd have to uh, be at the mercy of hoping for a good start to the fund. And I think a lot of fund managers, quite frankly, that I talked to at least, um, maybe that might be a, a shortcoming is that the, the perception that they will be able to get lightning in a bottle out of the gate and as you know, right now, being a small emerging manager is a really challenging environment for two very explicit reasons. One is that so much of the big institutional money is being directed to the tiny, very top of the pyramid element of hedge funds. And hence, there's a lot of us that are generally sort of passed over or, or ignored. And secondly, relates to as long as we've had a you know, now five and a half year plus period of of strong tailwinds at the back of especially U.S. equities. It's hard to, if you have a niche strategy, uh, induce people to kind of consider something, even if you have strong absolute returns, when they have such an easy way to make what seems to be easy money without much effort in a very low cost kind of environment. So organizationally, I think it's so important to be able to um, and I guess tying into that, that this concept is as an entrepreneur, mm. uh, that to think about this, not just as a strategy or focusing on, you know, the, the financial economic issues that you might love, but you've got to think about the practical elements of your operating a business and things like cash flow and, you know, profit loss statements and things like that. If you don't have not necessarily a mastery, but at least an understanding and or can outsource that effectively, I think you can get into real trouble real quickly, especially in an environment where, uh, I'll, I'll be frank, I mean, I expected a challenging environment. It's been even more challenging than I anticipated in sure. terms of being able to attract capital and the like. So sure. organization, that was kind of the chief thing that I did was make sure that I had a, a very good plan in place to maintain the business in the worst case scenario. And, and speaking on that, how much, just out of curiosity, I think a lot of people will really benefit from, from, uh, from this uh, part of the conversation, listening to, to your uh, you know, path and, and, and journey. What did you decide upon was enough of a runway to, to launch? And what did you decide was, the, in terms of the organization itself, um, 
how did you go about putting that plan together? Did you, uh, in terms of, you know, what do I need? I mean, mm, which right. employees do I need? What, op, you know, what, what, what parts of the business do I need to cover? Uh, how do I structure these things? What was the, take us, take me through that process. I think that's so important for people to, to, uh, to understand and appreciate. Right. Yeah. And so from my perspective, and I am very, very, very blessed because uh, my, my wife is actually the uh, intellectual horsepower of, of our household here. She's uh, She has been the CEO of the hedge fund, and she has a dual doctorate in business and sociology. And when she wrote her dissertation, it was selected as the best dissertation in her field. So she's unbelievably talented. So she sure. uh, had left her job in academia uh, several years ago. And so she was able to spearhead the operational side of things. Things. And I'll be the first to admit, I mean, and this is kind of my general philosophy of life is I try to play to my strengths and outsource my weaknesses. And in reality, I have infinite weaknesses and only a few strengths. So so for me, it's it's an issue of how can I you know, leverage what it is I both feel like I add the most value and that I get the most satisfaction from while being able to make sure that all these other things that need to be taken care of indeed happen. And so from my perspective, making sure that uh, from an operational standpoint that we were able to be, you know, really sound out of the gate to be able to. And the one nice thing is that um, in today's world, at least for emerging managers, there are better and better outsourcing options, essentially. I mean, clearly, you know, looking for, a, a, for us, getting a very good attorney out of the gate was very important, making sure that our fund administrator and that our accountants were, you know, on board and, you know, trying to strike the balance be between, of course, like getting the, the best in class would be great, but as an emerging manager, that's not necessarily cost effective. And so trying to find kind of the best balance of great service, great quality at a cost factor that, makes some remote sense was was very important. So sure. getting the outside advice, the counseling, um, and making sure operationally we were sound. And then after that, the very first hire uh, was getting a top-notch, uh, basically senior analyst slash junior partner. And so that hire, I, Evan Tuck is on board, and uh, he's somebody who's just been absolutely phenomenal. Because the danger of what I do is that I've been doing this for so long now that I need to constantly re-examine assumptions, hypotheses, theses. And so I knew I needed, and my wife is the first to admit that she has zero interest in currencies as a strategy. So sure. I, I needed somebody who was going to be able to challenge me, to push me, to make sure that I wasn't falling into mistaken beliefs or assumptions. And so getting Evan on board has been great. And so as we continue to expand, you know, I think our next serious uh, areas is kind of a systematized risk management sort of uh, person that we can rely upon. And so as we continue to grow, that that becomes like the next real focus, I think. Sure. And sort of two plus years into your uh, hedge fund manager journey, um, are you kind of following the plan that you originally thought or, or has the plan actually changed uh, uh, even in the first couple of years, you mentioned that certain things have, were more challenging than you thought. Uh, maybe there right. were even things that were easier than you thought. I don't know. Um, right. You're right. The, the, I mean, kind of two-edged sword. I mean, the returns were easier than we we sure. thought. We, we, we've out of the gate done better than what I'd expected. But the capital raising was even more challenging despite getting you know returns that I was sort of pleasantly surprised by. Uh, and it has modified the game plan a bit because I had sort of hoped to be further along in sort of building out the infrastructure of the hedge fund than we are now. But like you, like you kind of allude to, you sort of have to be um, dynamic in terms of your implementation of your system. In fact, I just went, I was just in Geneva actually, uh, and uh, a few weeks ago and an entrepreneurs conference and somebody was talking about business plans and they basically said, and I was very sympathetic to this, that tra traditional business plans plans generally need to be shredded because the the process that at least American business schools tend to instill in people is this static sort of check every box, you know, move along this path or whatever. Well, oftentimes it literally builds in like no variation and nothing ever goes the way one expects. And so to have a dynamic process 
ability to sort of reassess uh, uh, things as they're occurring in real time and be able to deploy resources where they strategically and tactically need to be be deployed at any given moment is really the challenge. So we have, you know, kind of been doing that along the way. Mm. Now, despite being a small team today, are you already thinking about what kind of organization you'd like to build five, ten years from now? Absolutely. Uh, the, I, I'm actually a believer that uh, personally that small teams are the best teams, at least for what it is that I'm doing. Now, if, if I was deploying a, a macro strategy across, you know, eight different asset classes and in a variety of different countries, then I think I'd have to modify this particular view. But given the fact that we're kind of dealing with a very top-down approach at the strategic level, I, I, I would like to have a team of between four and six people on the strategy level and an operations team that is roughly that same size. Uh, and so I would like in the next five years to think that, you know, we can with a dozen, 15 people have a really tightly oiled or, you know, tightly honed, well-oiled machine and to execute basically on what it is that we do. Sure. And, you know, I asked this question to the people who run big businesses and in, in, because there's always a lot of talk about uh, this, which is culture, but running a small business does culture play a role even in the initial stages, do you think? I, I actually think that's a completely underappreciated uh, issue, is that uh, really, to me, the more I think about the strategy element of building a business, branding who, what you are, who you, uh, who you are and what you stand for, really are the core values that's going to drive where that business goes in the future. And so for me, I'm obviously, my wife and I are very well aligned on that front. But, you know, hiring Evan, that was one of the key things is that, hey, is this somebody who has the same vision, the same passion for basically, hopefully offering a product that I mean, what gets entrepreneurs really excited is that, you know, there's something to share that, you know, we perceive that we have something that is of general utility and use, and we're excited about that. So to get somebody who is, um, who shares that passion, who has a sense of integrity, passion, commitment, diligence, patience, I, I think that to have those things as core values that drive everything about the business is so very important. So that's one of the things that I hope that we're kind of constantly being introspective and saying, okay, given what our values are, how are we doing on that front? Mm, Absolutely. Let's jump to the next topic and let's talk about track record. Um, Not in the traditional sense. Um, First of all, just remind me exactly when your program began. Uh, so June of 2012 is when we were able to, to launch. And when you started with no official track record, at least, um, how did you how did you visualize this product, this strategy to the initial investors that you were looking for? So one of the things I had tried to do in that 10 years when I was just managing my own money was to both be to the degree I could sort of a thought leader slash blogger. And, and so I would, I would post commentary and thoughts usually unrelated to currencies, mind you, because, uh, for me, especially in the 2007 time period, I was very, very concerned that we were collectively running off a second cliff, you know, just a few years after the dot-com crash. And again, I listened to my friends at cocktail parties and it wasn't dot-com stocks they were investing in, but it was second, third and fourth homes and they were flipping them and they were doing all this stuff on leverage, you know, zero down, interest only loans and crazy stuff like this. And, and obviously I wasn't the only one that thought this, there were a lot of people out there saying this is going to end very, very, very badly. And so Mm -hmm. I was trying to do everything I could to, uh, both, both kind of write and recommend and caution uh, people at that time. And so in so doing, I had sort of established enough of a 
uh, I guess, reputation for being a kind of a macro thinker in the investment world, that coming out of the gate with this very niche oriented strategy, we were able to, you know, attract uh, a number of different investors, both directly socially and also through connections as well. And I've continued to sort of build on that thought leadership strategy by, uh, you know, posting articles that I've written on their website. And Mark Faber has been kind enough to publish a couple of essays that I've written on the currency markets. And so through that, we've been able to attract um, some, some, uh, some people who actually I think are really impressive folks individually as people who are part of the fund. And so that was kind of the main strategy. I, I had a philosophy that, and this is again why I needed kind of such a long runway, is that uh, it's kind of, in the United States there was a movie with Kevin Costner, Field of Dreams, which kind of the, the big tagline is sort of build it and they'll come. And so my, mm-hmm. my thought had been is if I can build, if I can build a fund that is uh, based on sound analysis and hopefully very good long-term annualized returns, even if I enter into a period where I'm underperforming to begin with, time will be on my side. Mm. And and eventually, you know, the capital, my, my, my hope is that if you're able to produce such a product, and again, time is testing your strategy and you're being able to demonstrate returns that are, that are outperforming, that eventually you'll be able to attract the capital. Uh, so we had a core group of people that were ready to kind of invest based on both personal relationships sure. I've had as well as the thought leadership I was trying to do as well. And when people look at your track record today, um, how should they how should they interpret that? Is 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 the track record reflecting a strategy and approach which has been pretty uh, consistent uh, in terms of methodology from the beginning, or or um, you know from everything you learned uh, in in terms of managing your own funds for for a long while, uh, or has there been even you know, further evolvement in the way you do things in the first uh, couple of years? Uh, interpreting returns, I think, is a very critical thing for investors at every level, whether, whether or not they're the most sophisticated institutional investors or, or retail investors. And I, I think there are two components to that question. The first component is sort of, you know, given the returns that exist, how how much credence do you give them? And of course, one of the things that I absolutely believe is that past results are not indicative necessarily of future returns. It is interesting that the time period, which is again only about two and a half years of, of actual returns, has seen three very distinct sorts of somewhat anomalous time periods that when blended together, I think actually does construct a holistic story in that kind of out of the gate, and I think I mentioned as an individual investor, I had kind of the good timing of being able to invest in the U.S. dollar, sure. shorting the U.S. dollar as it became a began a long period of cyclical decline. Well, shortly after starting the hedge fund, individually, one of the biggest shorts that I had had for over a year was the Japanese yen from 2011 going into 2012. And as as you probably are aware, the towards the end of 2012, the Japanese yen just completely unwound. So that was an example of coming out of the gate where where you get kind of a home run that certainly doesn't occur in the currency markets on a on a yearly basis even happy to get it of course um, so then after that things period there was a period of sort of just kind of generally stable sort of consistent monthly returns which which is kind of the norm if you will but then in the last year or so we have seen a tremendous amount of turmoil in currency markets in particular and in particular the russian you know, situation and intervention initially in Crimea and then throughout eastern Ukraine and, and everything that's kind of been a kind of fallen out as a result of that, that definitely had a, a very negative impact on us, coupled with the fact that, as we kind of alluded to earlier in our conversation, I tend to think in this market there's more risks than remor- rewards from a kind of a macro asset class perspective. And so as a result, I've been more defensive than a would be typical uh, through this year, despite the fact that for most of the year, up until the second half, that proved to be a very unprofitable strategy. So in other words, there are kind of three very distinct time periods, but when you aggregate them together, you actually get something which I think would be, you know, fairly representative, if you will, of, of what I, I hope the, the fund will be able to do, basically. Um, so that's how I would respond to that. 
Well, let's move on to the next topic and talk about the trading program. We've sort of circled around it. I'm sure people would uh, are sitting waiting for us to uh, or for you to tell us <laughs> to tell us more about it. So um, before we dive deep into the program itself, I wanted to ask whether you designed it with a particular objective or philosophy, so to speak. Is there something like that that sort of drives the overall profile design of, of your strategy? Well, yes, to the extent that I, so when you look at, when you're trying to predict asset class movements, I've had this view that it's about the only area that I can think of where a longer time period can increase one's certainty factor. What I mean by that is, you know, let's use sports. I mean, if if the, uh, you know, trying to predict last year's World Cup uh, at the beginning of the World Cup was challenging, but you knew who the favorite teams were. If you were to ask the same person eight years from now, who's going to be the favorite, you know, the top three teams in the World Cup, it would be very difficult to impossible to do that. I mean, you're going to have completely different personnel, different coaches, you know, you, you just don't have any idea. But with assets, that's one of the few areas where the longer the time horizon, I think the clarity actually can increase. So the philosophy behind the structure that I said, the kind of calculus I set up was that you might ask me what I think is going to happen to the euro in the next six months. And I could maybe with a 55 to 60 percent confidence band give you an answer. But if there's a disequilibrium in the euro pricing vis-a-vis -vis other currencies and you were to extend that to say five years, then I can increase that confidence band to maybe 80% or 85% even. So the program was designed basically to capitalize on what I think is sort of the certainty factor that comes with fundamental analysis over time. And uh, that's why in picking the particular variables to look at, uh, it is very much a strategy that I try to use like with a three to 10 year window, essentially. I want to try an experiment here, Mark, and I know you're up for this. And that is, why don't we why don't we stay with the euro? And before we go into how it all works and so on and so forth, why don't you take a practical example of the euro and maybe guide us through for a few minutes where you think the euro will be in, say, five years time? How does this certainty actually come out you know in in your way of thinking i think that's that could be fascinating if you're up for it sure no a absolutely um so the the euro unlike the us dollar and the yen among the three major currencies doesn't typically typically get or it doesn't consistently get a safe haven kind of respite in in a situation where global markets become royal. Now, a lot of that obviously has to do with the potential insolvency issue related to Mediterranean countries and the like. So a lot of the expected movement in the euro is going to be connected to the general macroeconomic backdrop. So if one presumes that markets are auto reinforcing in the short term and mean reverting in the long term, which tends to be my general assumption. One might expect that so long as this particular uh, bout of kind of volatility in general asset markets doesn't unwind, that the euro could potentially stabilize and actually appreciate over some kind of short term time period. However, if one believes, as I do, that there is a fairly high probability that you will either have one of two scenarios, a sharp break in asset markets that occurs at some point in the next six to 18 months and an unwinding of general risk on trades, one would expect that the euro, uh, especially if there's further weakness out of Spain, Portugal, Italy, uh, uh, countries like that, could see some fairly significant losses. However, it's also possible that you might see a period of just stagnation is kind of flatlining of returns and asset markets, at which point my expectation is, is that the euro would sort of also be kind of just sort of bouncing along and stagnating. Now, the key is that if there's an Intrin intrinsic break that occurs. I mean, if one of those Mediterranean countries actually has a Greek-like event that occurs, sure. you know, 
that's when all of a sudden, you know, all bets are off and, you know, the floor could be rather low basically for the euro. But I do suspect that given the structural weaknesses of the euro, given the very challenging headwinds, uh, a low growth environment, countries that have very generally very high debt levels um, and demographics, which are not particularly favorable, as you're looking out three to 10 years, I think that there are going to be significant headwinds. So my expectation would be that the long-term horizon is going to be not a particularly favorable one for the Euro, especially versus what I would consider to be maybe more dynamic uh, emerging market currencies as well. Sure, okay, fascinating, very interesting. Now, why don't you try then and explain, now you've used some of the terminology, I'm sure, already, but let's try and, and sort of take the structured view, sort of a top-down view as to how your philosophy is, is, is sort of being expressed, sort of the components, the macroeconomics, the calculus, the disparity essentially that you're looking for between the fair value and the market values and, and how you put all of that together uh, in in a process, I, I, I guess is is the right word. Right. So essentially, um, you know, not surprisingly, there's sort of this kind of black box element, right? As far as uh, what it is that that goes to to the complete um, overall calculus and how it's implemented. But in general terms, and using some specifics, uh, there is um, current accounts are a significant issue in terms of currencies over time. Now, if current accounts are modestly either in surplus or modestly in deficit situations, that generally doesn't have a long-term impact. But when you begin to see chronic current account imbalances in either direction, that's where one could expect to see significant kind of medium to long-term movements in currencies. So that is definitely something that I sort of consistently look at. One of the things that actually makes currency investing rather intuitive to people is purchase power parity is a huge issue. I, I alluded to that a little bit, I think at the beginning when I talked about the dollar and if you were to be traveling and would go to Canada or Australia or um, New Zealand, your dollar would go a very, very, very long ways. There's a whole kind of uh, uh, area of academic research that generally tends to show that over long periods of time, purchase power parity does have a really meaningful impact on currency valuations over time. And so that's one of the things that we definitely look at as well. Now, it's not a one of the things that tends to be sort of nice, some people will use sort of naive purchase power parity standards, um, which can be problematic, is that standards of living make a huge difference as well. So people will think, oh, well, if I go to if I go to Vietnam and a good is 50% cheaper, well, then the Vietnamese currency must therefore be 50% undervalued. Well, the labor inputs that go into that particular good are also significantly less as well. So there's some adjustments that need to be made there. And another big, big, big issue to look at is interest rate differentials. And, you know, I, I, I there's been a number of CTAs, for instance, that have used for lack of a better word, sort of naive carry strategies. And somebody correctly identified, I'm sure, I'm sure you've heard this, that playing the carry trade is sort of like vacuuming up nickels in front of a steamroller. Sure. And and one of the things that I, I noticed and was able to sort of capitalize on as an individual investor was that back in 2007, the carry trade had taken on such huge magnitude and significance that you had currencies like the British pound that you know were yielding higher, but not significantly higher than a lot of the other major currencies that were getting a huge premium. And similarly, the yen was just getting annihilated. So the thing about interest rate differentials is if looked at in a vacuum, they can absolutely annihilate a portfolio. And so in kind of crafting a system or structure or calculus to be able to do this kind of assessment, um, one of the things was to be able to weight these various variables and to have a macroeconomic overlay that would dynamically adjust for the expected environment. And so there's a big discretionary element. So on one hand, it is highly systematized. You know, I can run this calculus and I can get a very, at least on paper, precise value for any of the currencies we follow. 
Having said that, it's an artificial precision, um, you know, because part of it is that in a dynamic world, even the data that I'm using is evolving and changing. And, you know, it might be as as recent as I can find it, but there's obviously even more recent so data out there. So for me, getting a sense of where the banding is in general for for various currencies, being able to see where the huge variations are, either in overvaluation or undervaluation, and then being able to use a macroeconomic overlay, which says, okay, well, there are certain risk on currencies that are going to be, no matter how fundamentally good they are, in a particular macroeconomic environment like 2008, 2009, they're, they're going to get destroyed. So that's that's where there's this very complex interplay, if you will, of kind of very specific, precise calculus-like determinations coupled with this very discretionary-based macroeconomic overlay. So let me try one of these things that you just mentioned there. Let me try a, 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 a one of my naive but but practical examples, and we'll see how your how your uh, uh, model of res- or, or response would be. As you mentioned, I live in Switzerland and I recently went to uh, to the US and I had to buy a pair of sneakers for my 10-year-old daughter. And, you know, mm-hmm. here in Switzerland, those sneakers is about 85 francs. I bought yeah. exactly the same pair two weeks ago in the US for $29. Yep. Um, so does that mean the Swiss franc is going to drop 50% uh, towards the dollar, do you think, in the coming years? You have identified the the thing that I modified more than anything else in terms of my uh, structural approach to currencies several years ago, which was what I and I, I deemed it to be at the time, and this was roughly two thousand and five or so, the Swiss franc conundrum. Mm. And and as you are probably well aware, that the Swiss franc, for the most part, has on a purchase power parity basis, remained somewhere between ridiculously and egregiously <laughs> overvalued sure. for for years and years and and just having been in Geneva I I, I was blown away I stopped in at a, at a at a modest looking Greek restaurant for a quick midnight snack and you know ordered basically like a kebab with some hummus and a coke and it was 39 US dollars sure. and I literally my mind almost exploded actually yeah. at that point um, I, I had a comparable situation as a brief aside I will definitely get back to this with Frank, but, but because this is relevant as well, is on one of my other uh, trips you know, to an entrepreneurial conference, went through Sydney, and I remember very distinctly, and this was back when the, the Australian dollar was a dollar eight US to get one Australian dollar, and I remember ordering a Hogarden uh, beer, a pint, in you know, draft pint in a, in a pub, and it was $18.50 US, <laughs> and, and I was already short the, the Australian dollar, but at that point I added to my shorts, Absolutely, literally I got yeah. home and I, it's like, wait, th- this, this can't sustain itself. Now, the reason why Switzerland, and I would love to talk a little about Singapore too, because sure. I think that's a really interesting country and there's some parallels distinctly. The reason why Switzerland gets this premium essentially is, is two things. One is the unbelievable level of, and, and if you look at current account surpluses, Switzerland and, and uh, Switzerland and Singapore consistently are basically at the top of the world. Getting the amount of foreign deposits essentially into the Swiss economy does so much basically to basically blow up, if you will, in a very good way, sure. overall standards of living, aggregate standards of living. Now, obviously, there's issues in terms of how that gets distributed, but that then creates essentially a massive premium on anything that's going to be produced in Switzerland. And the second thing is that as a result of that, and as a result of literally the you know centuries of Swiss banking acumen, there mm. is a premium that I think the global currency community, investing community places on the Swiss franc. And I think one of the fascinating things is going to be to see how this how this floor, if you will, with earth ceiling connected to the euro, you know, is going to hold over longer periods of time. You asked me where I thought the euro was going to be going in like, say, three, five, 10 years. Well, you know, this this 120 kind of uh, connection here with the Swiss franc and the euro in the short term is is quite manageable. I mean, Swiss bank obviously sure. has reserves, uh, you know, like to, to almost no end. But I'm a believer that longer term, there hasn't been an example of any economy, any country being deep enough pockets where they have been able to infinitely maintain a peg that is untenable outside of Hong Kong, basically. That's maybe the one 
one exception, which is a city state. I think you can say it's different on a number of different levels. So to answer your question, I actually expect that in a period of severe economic weakness in particular, it might be very difficult for the Swiss bank to be able to maintain that peg to the euro because you would expect those currencies to go in the opposite direction. I mean, people would want to flood, fl fly, flood into Swiss francs for safe haven purposes and euros might look extremely unattractive, basically. Mm. Mm, very interesting. I mean, if you you mentioned Singapore dollar, I mean, if you want to bring something up here, uh, feel free. Um, you know. So uh, yeah. yeah, Singapore, I I think is is a fascinating country, uh, a city state slash country from a currency perspective. They're the only country that I know of, at least, that actually attempts to manage inflation through their exchange rate. Right. And and the thing about Singapore is that it is especially in an era where you know Switzerland has sort of succumbed to international pressure, if you will, with regards to the secrecy of its banking system uh, and the like. And and Singapore has yet to do that. And as a result, uh, you've I think you've seen even more assets flood into Singaporean banks. And Singapore yeah. has definitely been a regional financial powerhouse for some period of time. Uh, my my uh, in-laws live in Jakarta for about a quarter of the year or so. And uh, there are you know these stories of ethnic Chinese getting on planes with suitcases for the short trip to Singapore, basically suitcases of money sure. to basically deposit in Singaporean banks. Because if you're in, living in a country like Indonesia, how comfortable are you with huge portions of assets remaining tied to domestic assets there? So Singapore, I think, is going to, like Switzerland, and their current account surpluses are even more impressive than Switzerland, mm. continue to attract a great degree of um, money from all around the region and the world. As a result, I expect that the Singapore dollar will be one of the more attractive currencies to hold in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. So, and again, one of the things is that when you have a currency that's quote managed, you definitely have a headwind as a as an investor. Now, Singapore has allowed the currency to gradually appreciate over time. And I think it's important to note that if we ever do enter into a period of kind of normalized economic, uh, macroeconomic times where you have positive interest rates and the like, I would expect that Singapore will have enough potential inflationary pressures that indeed they will want to allow their currency to strengthen over time as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that creates or will present a, a fairly interesting and attractive uh, investment opportunity going forward. Sure. Interesting. Very interesting. Now, so you have your proprietary fundamental analysis. You mentioned, uh, you know, sort of the things that you look at. But then you, as far as I understand, you also have some kind of analytical overlay where you look at commitment reports, sentiment, and and even something that you call cocktail chatters. I don't know whether that means you go to a lot of you go to a lot of cocktail parties, but uh, but I'm intrigued. So please do uh, enlighten me here. Sure. And, and I sort of stopped short in our previous conversation because I sort of mentioned, you know, have this kind of calculus and then we have this macroeconomic overlay. Sure. Well, we really kind of look at it like a funnel because the biggest and most important overlay is definitely the macroeconomic right. overlay. That, that has that has uh, that has affected our my investment policy individually, especially navigating something like the lead up to and then the general financial crisis and then the aftermath, um, as well as for the hedge fund in the last two and a half years. But sort of the second overlay kind of down in the funnel is a sentiment based overlay. And I think I, you know, we talked a little bit at the very beginning of the conversation about how I tend to label myself as a contrarian, at, at least at the extremes. And I tend to have this kind of general philosophy that if, if everybody is on the same side of the trade, then it seems like you will have great opportunity if, at least in the medium long term, if you're on the other side of it, assuming you're not involved in a value trap. I'd be the last person in the world to invest in a company, no matter how good it looked, if they were producing like eight track cassettes or something like that. But assuming that in the currency world, you don't have a Zimbabwe or an Argentina or something like that, where they're essentially debasing and ruining the currency quite quite intentionally, um, you you generally at the extremes have opportunities that generally present themselves. So uh, for me in the past, what I've done in terms of, again, talking to what I consider to be smart, dumb money at, at cocktail parties and whatnot, is that if I sense that there's 
a particular investment thesis that everybody has grabbed onto, then I will almost without exception be on the other side of that trade, basically. But we also do look at commitment of trader reports because there are, it's interesting to see how they disaggregate themselves in terms of you, you have kind of like the, the commercial positions, but then you have the, you know, both you know, hedge fund positions, you have small investor positions and mutual fund positions as well. And, and those types of investors all tend to kind of at different levels of magnitude at extremes act in very predictable ways, we find at least. So that's where we've used that as well to um, modify positions that we would have. So it might be that our calculus is saying that the um, that the Singapore dollar is particularly attractive. But then if we get um, there's something that happens, maybe regional insecurity occurs in that particular area or there's a particularly bad economic report there that temporarily takes down the markets. I generally have taken an approach that those kinds of data indicators tend to be, quote, noise. They they sure they'll have a short term effect. But in, unless there is unless it's indicative of a longer term secular trend, it tends to be rather inconsequential. But it might present opportunity if there is a movement down and sentiment goes against a particular currency, for instance. So that's kind of the second sort of analytical overlay. And then the final analytical overlay is a, a risk overlay, which we use because one thing that I've found personally before I open the hedge fund, and again, another reason to wait a long time before opening a hedge fund is you want to learn all the mistakes you can on your own dime as opposed to other people's dimes. And in the past, when I mechanically followed my formula, what I realized is there would be certain instances where I would have a whole series of currencies that all aligned on the same risk on, risk off kind of spectrum. And as a result, I was exposing myself to a portfolio that was prone to um, systemic shock volatility, basically. So now we employ a, a risk overlay where we make sure that, okay, we don't have most of, you know, a disproportionately large portion of our portfolio that's all on a risk on kind of environment, especially if given our macroeconomic overlay, we think there might be a risk of a dislocation or something. Sure. So Mark, is it fair to say that the first part you were talking about is more sort of scientific? You put numbers into a so piece of software, so to speak, and it spits out some um, fair values for these currencies that you look at. And then comes these overlays, which is really information to you that you can then apply in a discretionary way. Is that kind of that's, how it works? That's precisely right. That's okay. that's exactly right. Okay. Um, how many currencies do you trade? A little over 20. Okay. And What's the least liquid currency you trade today? Uh, well, so one of the nice things is being on the spot market, uh, and that's so we're organized as a CPO, and I, I had kind of a choice of doing like a CTA with managed futures, and some of the futures are not particularly liquid, and they're especially not liquid if you try to get any kind of uh, duration, essentially, in the futures market. But on the spot market, uh, even, I, I guess it might be the South African Rand, but even in that situation, um, there's never been a time where like there, there hasn't been like a, a, an opportunity sure, sure. to get in or get out. Okay. And um, do you expect that number of, of currencies to change over time or or is this really a... Uh, I guess it goes also... I mean... Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.